sort of switch gears a little bit. Um, I'm Meg Ro McLean. I am a teaching uh, I'm teaching faculty here at the University of um, Massachusetts Amherst, as well as a research associate at the Harvard Forest. Um, this session is on the carbon consequences of climate change and invasive species management and invasive species writ, writ large. Um, and so we're kind of peeling back and looking at more of a landscape view on a lot of this and um, diving a little bit more into recent research. So the three of us that will be presenting will present for about 10 minutes each and show some of our more recent work in this area, particularly in the realm of forest pests. Um, and we've been hearing a lot about those already. Um, and that, but our hope is that for these short talks, these will prompt questions from all of you. And so like in the last one, we'll have dedicated time for question and answers at the end of our talks. Um, so please, just like before, use the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen, send us your questions anytime throughout the talks, and we'll answer them at the end. Um, all right, I'm actually doing double duty today. I'm both the first speaker and the moderator of the session. So I will get us started um, and get my presentation going. Um, sorry for the delay. That's the trouble with being both a present presenter and moderator. All right. Um, the first thing I do want to start with, though, is um, much of the work that I'm presenting here today has been done in collaboration with the Thompson Lab at Harvard Forest, as well as many of the people here on the uh, Northeast Risk Leadership Team. So I wanted to do a quick thank you to all of the collaborators that I've worked with this on and for making this work possible. So like we've been talking about for the last day and a half, um, climate change and forest pests interact in many different ways to change forest dynamics. This is just a screenshot from our management challenge in September that outlines a lot of the different ways. But I wanted to throw it up here to say that this is what we're mostly going to be talking about in this session and how these two things interact to change, in particular, our carbon outlook and as we think about uh, mitigating climate change and forests, if especially in the Northeast, are a big part of that. And so my research question for this talk in particular is what are the direct and indirect impacts of invasive forest pests on forest ecosystems and carbon? Um, and so you know, we don't wanna think about carbon on its own and we wanna make sure that we're thinking about the forest as a whole not just um, thinking about our, the carbon impacts. So keeping that in mind as well. And then when I say indirect impacts, what I'm actually talking about for the most part in the Northeastern forest is management. And so what is our management response to forest pests and how might it change? So how might our management change in response to forest pests? And the challenge with this is that more than half of the forests in the Northeast are owned and managed by family forest owners. And you all know this very well, um, but they all make semi-independent decisions about how they manage their forests and how they might respond to pests. And another piece to all of this is that we know that we're likely to see a lot more forest pests in the future. So the continuation of climate change, pests moving north, um, along with international trade, more pests being introduced to our area. And so we need to prepare for that, that change. And how do we prepare for these, these pests that we don't even know about yet? Um, and some ways that I'll, I'll walk through today in specific instances and examples um, are things like how do do, how do forest owners and managers change their decision-making strategies in the face of, of pests? How does the interaction of invasive pests and management impact our carbon outlook as we think about policy in particular and mitigating climate change? And then how can we better prepare landowners, managers, and policymakers for future outbreaks? And policy was, has been talked about on and off for the last couple of days, and it's a huge part of this. And so I'll be talking a little bit about how I've been working with the state to include invasives in our um, assessment of land and land use and carbon on the land and how, how that might change in the future with invasives. So to start, how do people change what they do? So as part of some research, collaborative research I did a while ago, um, we sent out a survey to ask woodland donors in New England, in particular the Connecticut River watershed, uh, what they might do 
in response to hypothetical insect scenarios. So we didn't even give them a specific insect. We said, what if this imaginary insect approaches your land? What would you do? And each of those scenarios had different things like how much of the trees would, how many of your trees would die because of this pest? Um, how fast the trees would die because of the pest um, and when that pest might arrive and things like that. And in response, about 84% of the private landowners said they would harvest in response to at least one of those hypothetical insect scenarios. So that's a pretty high percentage of people that said, mm, I would think about it. I would think about initiating a harvest because of this pest. 29% um, said, said, no matter what, I will always harvest. 8% um, said they would never, no matter what, harvest. And then 63%, it depended on the scenario that was presented. And they were each presented with at least four scenarios. There are a few variables that were most impactful in predicting that harvest response. And, and those were things like, what is the severity of the infestation? So how, much, how many of the trees would die and how quickly? Um, but also parcel size and location influenced their probability of harvest. Uh, it turns out people in New Hampshire were always more likely to harvest than anywhere else, which is interesting. Um, but also the larger their parcel, unsurprisingly, they were more likely to harvest as well as par a parcel that had been owned for commercial purposes or had been cut prior, was more likely to also be cut again. So we could take the results from these survey and actually then apply it to a specific instance. We could take the characteristics of an infestation like emerald ash borer and say, well, can we uh, predict approximately how many people or parcels would get harvested in response to something like emerald ash borer on the landscape? And when we did that, what we found was if we assumed a typical harvest response from current um, forest inventory data, if we assumed what we found as a typical harvest intensity applied to these parcels, around 13% of the biomass, meaning live carbon, so 13% of that live carbon was removed. However, this was done when I did this, I made some very specific assumptions about what a harvest response looked like for EAB, I assumed a typical harvest. But what if we actually took this opportunity as a time where we could practice adaptive management? And so instead of sticking with this, we're just gonna have a typical harvest response to EAB. What if instead we think about how we can use this as an opportunity for adaptive management and think about working with the land and thinking about climate change in our management response? And so that's my hope. Um, and when we think about this, some of the options for thinking about adaptive management are using something like the resistance resilience transformation frameworks for thinking about adaptive management within the forests. Um, and I know we heard about this a little bit yesterday with Amanda Mahaffey, and I liked the quote of manage the forest, not the insect. Um, and so this is the idea here. What if we actually instead, instead of responding with our typical harvest, what if we took this as an opportunity? for better management. Um, what I did then was thinking, thinking about this and thinking about how can we um, look at what the implications of doing adaptive management rather than our typical harvesting, what would that do to our landscape into the future? I worked with an undergraduate doing his senior thesis last year to think through what that might look like out to 50 years from time of harvest. So um, one of the ways that we did this is we used a mechanistic model called Landis to grow on a theoretical uh, landscape, grow trees, uh, and then apply a harvest, and then grow them 25 and 50 years out from that harvest, and look at the ecological response on those, on those little landscapes. Um, we did a few different trials and we did a few different uh, applications of our, our silvicultural prescriptions. Um, one In one of the scenarios, we just grew the trees and said, the trees are there, there, is no, there are no bugs, what happens? Um, and these were all simulated with climate change. So that this is just trees growing with climate change. Fortunately, in the Northeast, our trees will grow a little bit better because of climate change for the most part, they have no disturbance. Um, so this is just growing trees, no disturbance. Um, and then we applied bugs and we said, okay, um, the bugs come through, kill off all our ash trees. So you can see red is ash. Um, what happens in, the, in that instance? 
to what's on the landscape. Um, and then we applied a resistance silvicultural prescription, a resilience and tra transition um, prescriptions. And all of these are fashioned after the Adaptive Silviculture and Climate Change Project, um, in particular uh, ones that were applied in the Dartmouth Second College grant site in New Hampshire, where the site lead is Tony D'Amato. And we then altered them a little bit, um, thinking about the presence of EAB in, in that landscape and how that might change those prescriptions a little bit and making it more appropriate for um, more Southern New England. Um, and then we also applied a salvage harvest where just ash was removed or the host species were, was removed. And, um, and then finally a high grade, which is a uh, silviculture prescription that is not recommended to continue where you just take out the good stuff. Um, and then looked at how or what species remained and grouped them into how well adapted they are for climate um, in climate change. So uh, the green is poorly adapted, fair is fair adapted to climate, and then um, good is actually well adapted to climate and how the proportions of each of those changed. And what you'll notice is that um, in each of these prescriptions, we took more or less biomass or carbon, um, depending on what those prescriptions called for. Um, but by year 50, a lot of those differences have, have been reduced quite a lot. Um, and you see things in like the, the transition, we have planted trees where those are well adapted to climate. Um, and so we're starting to think about, okay, how might those different applications look years out from now, um, especially in the face of different invasive species. We did a similar thing for HWA. I know I'm running long on time, so I'm just gonna keep going. Um, but then finally, when thinking about carbon, this isn't the, the what's on the landscape isn't the end of the story. And so another piece of the work that we're doing is thinking about what happens to that wood when you take it off. So if, if you are doing adaptive silvicon you do take a little bit more off the landscape. Um, you get slight, you know, more growth on the landscape. So those trees, if they're kept in forest, um, hopefully will grow back. Um, and then some of the wood that you take off the landscape also can be put into storage. And so we're connecting those pieces of when we take stuff off the landscape, where does it go? And so this is one of my models for that. Um, and we're working at the Massachusetts scale. So we're actually working with EEA to say, okay, if we harvest, what does that harvest look like? Can we make it better? And then what happens to the wood when it comes off the landscape? How much of, is it, of, is it, of it is emitted versus how much is stored? Um, and that's what you're seeing here is that when we do just typical harvest across the landscape, uh, about two thirds of what you take off the landscape is emitted and about one third is stored um, given current rates. And then we can actually work with the state to then present new scenarios. And some of the scenarios that we're working on right now with the state is to include things like disturbances from hurricanes and invasives. And so what does that do to our carbon storage pools? Um, and how does, how does that change if we change the silviculture prescriptions that follow those disturbances. So that's kind of the, the future of where we're going with that. All right, so thank you. And I will pass it to my next presenter. And Brandon, hopefully. Great. Hello. Uh, Hi, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, so I will quickly introduce Brendan. Um, so uh, Brendan is coming from us from Cornell University, and he's studying the multiple stressors affecting forest health, including invasive species, deer overabundance, and climate change, as well as how to evaluate whether management actions achieve obje uh, desired objectives. Brendan will be giving us a more national perspective, so presenting okay. on how insect and disease disturbances correlate with reduced carbon sequestration in forests, uh, in forests of the contiguous United States. So, thank you. So, uh, just to confirm, everyone can see my screen right now? Yes. Not okay. in presenter mode yet, though. Not in presenter mode. How about now? Yeah. 
Great, thank you. Perfect. All right, hello everyone. Um, again, my name is Brendan Corian and I'm a graduate student at Cornell University. And I'm gonna be presenting um, on some work that I've been involved in the past few years. If, if you remember, I think three or four years ago, I presented on this topic at risk and it was just the onset of this project. And um, it's something that I was working on while at the Nature Conservancy. And it kind of followed me as a project to Cornell. I'm glad I had the opportunity to continue working on it and lead this project to completion. Um, this work is now published in Frontiers in Forest and Global Change. Um, it was published just earlier this past year. So I'm happy to be able to provide an update to you all. Um, and I apologize for some duplication in, in what I presented on a few years ago for those of you that were able to attend that. So um, as, a, the, as the title says, I'm gonna be presenting on insect and disease disturbance and um, how it correlates with reduced carbon sequestration in forests of the contiguous United States. So it probably goes without saying, but carbon sequestration starts with this chemical equation, which is the chemical equation for photosynthesis, where large amounts of carbon dioxide are removed from the atmosphere by plants and sequestered in plant materials. And trees are particularly important in this regard because that carbon that is sequestered from the atmosphere is stored in large quantities in wood, whether it be their trunks, their branches, their roots, and that wood persists on the landscape for large periods of time. And for this reason, forests have been identified as one of our primary allies for mitigating the effects of climate change long-term. And so it should be no surprise that um, anything that affects or limits a tree's ability to photosynthesize is going to limit its ability to sequester carbon. And this can be um, fire, it can be blowdown events, it can be competing vegetation or geologic events. What I'm gonna be focusing on today are forest pests and pathogens, but I'm also very interested in this topic as well, the effect of deer overabundance on this um, in, in forests of the Northeast. And we know that um, forest pests and pathogens have been accumulating in the United States. This is a, a map from um, Sandy Liebold's work in 2013 that shows the accumulation of non-native forest pests and pathogens across the United States. And it shows that areas of the Northeast and Western United States are um, the hot spots of introduction because these are trade hubs. And these pests are coming in primarily on um, wood and ornamental plants through international trade. We also know that native pests such as pine beetles are becoming more severe in um, parts of the Western United States in relation to climate change and are having impacts on carbon sequestration in those areas as well. Looking forward, we know that the situation is not great as far as whether we can expect new forest pests and pathogens. Alchema et al. in 2010 shows that the number of insect pests is increasing and the number of wood boring insects, which are most severe to tree health is actually accelerating in recent decades. Boyd et al. found a similar trend with the number of pests increasing substantially over time. And even if we project out into the future, with modeling and maintaining the status quo with our current uh, preventative regulations, such as ISPM 15, we know that new pests and pathogens are going to arrive. So it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when um, more non native insects and diseases will be on the way. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we going to maintain the status quo or are we going to try and do something to prevent new pests from arriving? So that, really framed the um, research that I'm gonna be talking about today in collaboration with um, the US Forest Service, Purdue University, the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies and the Nature Conservancy. And again, I started this while I was at TNC and um, it was just completed last year. And our primary research questions were, has recent insect and disease disturbance reduced the capacity of US forests to sequester carbon? And if so, by, by how much? The first question, you know, based on what I showed earlier is, should be kind of assumed. Anything again that affects um, a plant's ability to photosynthesize will reduce its ability to sequester carbon. But no one had ever tried to quantify this across the United States. And that's what we felt like was most important. So we used uh, national forest inventory data to get at this question. If you're not familiar with the National Forest Inventory, it's a program administered by the US Forest Service that um, deploys monitoring plots across the United States 
And on those plots, which are depicted um, here, there are a variety of things that are recorded, including um, soil sampling, vegetation um, monitoring, down woody debris. And the intensity of the monitoring is, is pretty impressive. On forest lands, there are over 130,000 monitoring plots right now. And on non-forest lands, there's over 186 for a total of um, 316,000 plots across the United States. But what we were most interested on these plots was the measurements of live tree biomass. And so um, we defined carbon sequestration capacity on these plots as the estimated average annual rate of carbon accumulation in live trees less than 2.5 centimeters um, dBH on unharvested forest land. Now that sounds complicated, but it's, it's really not. So I'm gonna break this down for you. So when plots are established, an initial measurement is made of the trees on that plot and their biomass. Then several years later, a second measurement is recorded and on those same trees and on those same plots. If we take the difference between those biomass measurements and essentially divide by the number of years in between those two measurements, that gives us an average annual rate of carbon sequestration change in megagrams carbon per hectare per year. So this is the primary metric that we were focusing on. And we were also interested in the disturbance types that may affect that. So this is just a depiction of what the um, sampling scheme is under National Forest Inventory. Usually there's two or three plots per county. And for each one of those plots, um, disturbance types are recorded. And so um, for our purposes, we were interested in looking at the plots that had no disturbance and comparing those against plots that had disease disturbance and insect disturbance. And it's important to note that a disturbance type is recorded only when there's evidence of mortality or damage to 25% of the trees or 50% of an individual species count since the last measurement and the disturbance is at least 0.4 hectares in size. So these are not small disturbance events that are being recorded. These are substantial disturbance events that are um, occurring on these plots and being recorded under the National Forest Inventory. And for our purposes, we were interested in looking at the most recent remeasurement interval, which spanned from 2001 to about 2019 and seeing the magnitude of um, disturbance and its effect on carbon sequestration over that period of time. So just for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go into the analysis that we conducted. I'm just gonna dive right into the results. If you're interested in looking um, at this work more, please refer to the, uh, the publication that I mentioned. But if we look at plots that um, had no disturbance across the United States, this is what we see. So what you're seeing on this map are um, essentially small hexagons that aggregate national forest inventory plots in a particular area. And the colors represent the amount of carbon being sequestered by the trees on those aggregated plots. So for plots that had no disturbance, you can see that the majority of those areas are sequestering carbon, which is what we would expect. This is what we want to see. If we look at, oh, one more thing. So you'll also notice that there's um, no remeasurement data for um, the Rocky Mountain states. So um, for those states, we only had a first measurement back in 2001, we didn't have a second measurement to rely on uh, closer to 2019. So we couldn't calculate an average uh, rate of change for those particular states, which is a limitation that we currently have. And I'll, I'll reference that later as it affects our results. If we then look at insect disturbance, you'll notice that um, for those particular plots, we're more in these brown shades and, and lighter green shades. So these plots are not sequestering as much carbon as those that are not disturbed. And similarly, if we look at disease disturbed plots, it's not as dramatic as insect disturbance, but um, we're also seeing areas where um, forests are not sequestering as much carbon. So I think we can answer yes to this question here, has insect and disease disturbance reduced the capacity of US forests to sequester carbon? But the, the real question is by how much and does it really matter? And so we estimated the average annual change in live tree biomass, biomass on NFI plots for each of one of these disturbance types. And for plots that had no disturbance, we found that they sequestered about 1.44 megagrams carbon per hectare per year. Disease disturbed plots on average were about 1.04 and insect disturbed plots were about 0.45 on average. And so if we think about 
um, plots with no disturbance kind of being at 100% capacity to sequester carbon. That means disease disturbed plots were only about 72% of that capacity and insect disturbed plots were only about 31% of that capacity. We also wanted to evaluate this nationally and come up with an estimate for the national impact. So what, how we did this is we pulled in data for um, the area of the Rocky Mountain states that had no remeasurement. We pulled in the data for that first measurement that occurred to calculate or estimate the uh, proportion or area of forest land that's been impacted by insect and disease disturbance. We then are applied our modeled estimates that I just showed on the previous slide to those impacted areas in the Rocky Mountain states and throughout the rest of the country to come up with a national impact estimate. And what we found is, um, why is that? There we go. Um, insect disturbed areas um, resulted in a reduction of about 9.33 teragrams carbon per year. And disease disturbance resulted in about 3.49 reduction teragrams carbon per year for a total reduction of about 12.83 teragrams carbon per year. So what, what does that really mean? And is that a meaningful number? So to just kind of um, give you some context as to um, what that represents, that's about about 9% of um, the total US forest carbon sequestration capacity annually, or it's about um, adding 10 million passenger vehicles annually to our roads. So that should give you some sense of the magnitude here. We also think that those estimates are conservative and there's, there's two important reasons for that. One is the, the National Forest Inventory's definition of disturbance, um, which I mentioned early, earlier. It does not account for low intensity disturbance events. It, it accounts for these large disturbance events. So we're missing a lot of the information related to um, uh, leaf defoliators, for example which may come in, remove the foliage from, from trees for a period of time. But by the time the plot is remeasured, those trees have, or those leaves have grown back and it's not gonna be recorded as a disturbance event. So we know those types of disturbances are also affecting carbon sequestration, but we could not capture that in this analysis. As I mentioned earlier, we also lack remeasurement data for the Rocky Mountain states. And we know that those states are heavily impacted by insect and disease disturbance. They're also slow growing forests, so it's kind of uncertain as to whether, um, you know, our analysis would change in any, you know, real way or, or substantial way if we did have that data, but um, we suspect that it would have increased our, our estimates for the amount of um, um, carbon that's being um, not sequestered from those forests. So to wrap things up here, I just want to um, touch on a few implications. So the first is there are some real implications here for improved forest pest prevention in international trade policies. Honestly, carbon sequestration is only one of the arguments that should be made in this arena. Um, forest pest interdiction is a matter of biodiversity loss. It's a matter of economic, economics, human health. So this is just one piece of the puzzle in improving forest pest um, interdic interdiction rates. We also have some implications here for improved forest management. Um, especially for native pests in the West. There are some important things that we should consider to um, ensure that our forests are resilient to pest outbreaks. And additional research is needed here. Um, we tried to evaluate a variety of things and it, it turns out that um, either the data is not available or is not um, fine enough resolution for us to address a lot of these things. So more work needs to be done in, in this area. And then some limitations of this work that I'll touch on. Um, first off, the National Forest Inventory does not differentiate between native and non-native insects and disease disturbance. So we cannot say whether um, invasive insects and diseases are having a greater effect on carbon sequestration than natives right now. And that's one of the questions I'd really like to know or have an answer to is, are the, are the natives the primary actor here or are the invasives playing a more primary role? As I mentioned, we're missing measurement de data for the Rocky Mountain states. So again, that should be considered just a small grain of salt, salt in our analysis. Um, we only evaluated change over one national forest inventory remeasurement period. So ideally we would, we would know this over multiple remeasurement periods to see if this is kind of this you know, stable loss of sequestration that we're experiencing from insects or disease or is it accelerating? Is it becoming more severe over time? And um, 
we did not account for carbon transfers to dead organic matter, soils, or salvaged wood, as uh, Meg mentioned in her presentations. And this analysis does not account for climate change, some extreme weather events, or changes in atmospheric chemistry that are not picked up in the National Forest Inventory, but can affect our carbon sequestration rates in our forests. So um, that's all I have. Here's uh, the paper um, that was published uh, late last year. And thank you for the opportunity to present quickly. Thanks, Brendan. All right. We will switch to our last talk of this session uh, with Audrey Barker Plotkin. Um, Audrey Barker Plotkin is a senior scientist at the Harvard Forest Site Manager for the Harvest, Harvard Forest Long Term Ecological Research Site, PI, for the Harvard Forest LTRRU program, as well as a PhD candidate here at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She does a ton. Um, so Audrey will be taking a deeper dive into two specific examples of how forest pests are altering the landscape um, with her presentation. So I'll let her take that away. Thank you. Okay, so just wanna make sure I got my timer going. Excellent. Thank you so much. Those were great talks, Brendan and Meg. So building on what uh, the first two talks were focused on, I'm going to delve into two specific examples based on field studies that I run in central Massachusetts. So hemlock and oak are among the dominant tree species where I am. So I'm going to first talk about Lymantria and oak. So Lymantria dispar was introduced in 1869 right here in Medford. It's still expanding its range west and south. And it's well established in New England. Since the late 1800s, uh, Lymantria has had periodic outbreaks that cause major defoliation. Oak is its major host in New England, and oaks can typically tolerate one to two years of defoliation, but with more intense or frequent de uh, defoliations, mortality can result. Um, from 2016 to 2018, Southern New England had the worst Lymantria dispar outbreak that it had experienced in nearly 30 years. And this map shows the last year of the outbreak um, and shows estimated defoliation based on satellite data. So blue is things are okay, yellow to red is more intense defoliation. And this yellow rectangle is the study area that I focused in on for this study and as well as the next. And the data I'm going to present are from a set of permanent plots that I established in the Quabbin Watershed and Harvard Forest. And these span a defoliation gradient. So I had one plot that escaped defoliation, three that were defoliated one year only, four that were defoliated two years consecutively, and three that were really hit hard and defoliated all four years. And I'm going to focus on the immediate carbon losses. So this graph shows the total above ground biomass of the trees. And the units here is our biomass in metric tons per hectare. Um, and biomass, if you divide that by about by two, that's the carbon content. And I just wanna distinguish between carbon stocks and carbon sequestration. So you can think of carbon stocks as, for example, like the total amount you have in your savings account. Whereas carbon flux is like the balance of income coming in and bills going out over a year. Here, I'm just gonna look at the change in that savings account after this major defoliation. And what you can see is that depending on the, how many years a site was defoliated, you get an increasing hit to that savings account of carbon that's stored in the trees. Um, the plots that were defoliated just one year only lost about 12% of their carbon um, in the trees. Two years running, about a quarter. And the, the two plots that were defoliated three years consecutively lost more than 60% of their standing carbon stocks. So that's pretty major. And to tie this into how might climate change interact with Lymantria dispar populations, well, there's a few different ways. So this photo shows a dead Lymantria dispar caterpillar, and it's all white and fuzzy and hanging upside down. And that indicates that it was killed by the fungal pathogen Entomophaga mimaga. 
So Lymetria dyspar outbreaks have been moderated since 1989 when this pathogen became established in the Northeast. However, like most fungi, Entomophaga mymaga is sensitive to moisture and it's likely less effective in controlling the caterpillar in warmer, drier springs. So with climate projections, well, the Northeast is supposed to keep increasing um, its annual precipitation, but when you combine that with increasing temperatures and more variability in precipitation patterns, the likelihood of drought increases across most climate scenarios, which you can see here um, from a 2019 Forest Service report. In addition, drought stress lowers oak resilience to defoliation, so the impacts of an outbreak could be larger. All right, moving right along to the next example, hemlock woolly adelgid and hemlock. So here is a hemlock woolly adelgid, thank goodness, not life size. In real life, it's about the size of a poppy seed. So what you typically see is the white woolly coating that protects the insects. And what the adelgids do is to insert a feeding tube into the base of a needle and suck the tree sap. And that kills the tree standing. But another consequence is human ad action prompted by the adelgid infestation. And that's a lot of what Meg was talking about, that landowners sometimes choose to harvest timber from infested forests. And we were really interested in how the direct effects of adelgid differ from human-mediated changes prompted by logging. So in 2003, my colleagues and I at Harvard Forest established an experiment to study the effects of killing hemlock standing versus logging removal. And I'll note that at that time, hemlock woolly adelgid had not yet arrived at Harvard Forest. So we had two treatments. Um, one, we girdled the tree. So we cut with a chainsaw, we cut the phloem and a bit into the xylem to kill the tree standing. And that's emulated death by adelgid. We also designed um, a logging treatment that was based on an analysis of you know, real hemlock salvage um, operations that we, that we noticed. And let's see, we collected some baseline data before we implemented the treatments and then did the girdling and logging in 2005. And we did this on um, a block design where we have two replicates of each treatment. And each plot is about two acres in size. And we had a hemlock, you know, untreated hemlock reference. So what I'm gonna show you is now 15 years later, how the carbon stocks have changed. And I'll just note that we inventory the live trees um, in the overstory every five years. So you can see what's the live woody biomass. In, in this case, metric tons of carbon per hectare. So I already did that dividing the biomass by two for you. And you can see that before the treatments, all the plots were very similar in their above ground carbon in the trees. And that after the treatments, the girdling logged plots each lost around 70% of their total. And that at 15 years, the carbon stocks were far from recovered. Um, they still, the girdled in log plots still only have about half the live biomass they started with. Whereas in contrast, the, hemlocks refer the hemlock reference plots have increased their live biomass by 8% because they kept growing. So now switching from that savings account, the carbon stocks to the income and bills, um, the net production, and this, is, this graph shows the net of the above ground woody production, the cumulative production over that 15 years. So rather than annual, just summed up over that time. Um, that's to highlight that over 15 years, biomass production is lower in the treated plots than in the untreated reference plots. And you know, by now in year 15, there's thousands of new stems growing into the forest in the logged plots, especially in starting to get into the girdle plots as well. And young forests are often thought to sequester carbon, sequester carbon at a higher rate than older forests. But as yet, we are not seeing evidence of enhanced above ground net primary production in those sites. <clears throat> 
So how might climate change affect hemlock woolly adelgid populations? So if you were here yesterday, you would have seen Caroline Marshner's great talk on this. And she especially noted that with warming temperatures, hemlock decline and mortality happens more quickly. And that's really because cold snaps are key to knocking back hemlock woolly adelgid populations. But cold snaps are becoming less common, um, especially you know, winter warming is the, is the number one symptom of climate change in the Northeast. And even with cold snaps, some adelgids survive. And there's also evidence that hemlock woolly adelgid can adapt at least somewhat to colder temperatures. So just to wrap up, forest carbon stores and production will recover, but it will take decades. It's not gonna be you know, 10 or 20 years. And climate change is likely to exacerbate Lymantria dispar and hemlock woolly adelgid. So really, you know, to reiterate what Meg and Brendan said, you know, we really need to focus on managing for a resilient forest, diversity of species, and to really advocate for policies to prevent the next invasive insect from establishing. So thank you very much, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Audrey. Um, yeah, feel free, anyone, to add your questions. We might have time for one or two if we're quick. Um, questions in the, the Q&A, so if you'd like to add any, please do. Uh, um, Brandon, you look like you are answering one currently, which is awesome. Um, I also sort of I put together one that was I think involved most of us. Um, basically, uh, it sort of builds on everything that we just learned, and that that the carbon dynamics in response to pests is it, it's complex. Um, and so if we think about how might this knowledge or new knowledge about um, forest pests to influence, influence that those carbon dynamics, how can we inform policy decisions either at the local or state or regional level? What are the things that we can we can think about and talk about um, in our area? Go ahead, Audrey. There's a couple of things that I would point out. I mean, there's so one is thinking about you know carbon markets, um, and that really we need to make sure that we account for the potential impact of carbon loss from insect invasive insects and diseases um, when developing like the sort of insurance or buffer pool for those. So that's, that's one, def that's definitely one thing. And then, you know, really building on great work done at the Cary Institute, um, promoting tree smart trade. I think, you know, really better uptake of those policies would go a long way, you know, not to keep the ones we have from, um, you know, we can't, we're not going to kick them out but um, to keep new ones from arriving. And, you know, especially I feel like we've lucked out a little bit in that hemlock and ash, although those are, you know, very important species, they are not dominant across large regions. So if there was something that say attacked red maple, we'd be in big trouble. Brendan, do you wanna add anything? No, I, I largely agree. I feel like this situation is one where we actually know what we need to do. It's just a matter of getting the, um, the policy and public support necessary to do so. So um, there is a, still a large lack of awareness in this area. I found um, people still don't know uh, the consequences of forest pests and pathogens on the landscape. And that's, I think, the starting point for broader discussions at the policy realm. People need to be hearing about this and um, you know, feeding it up to their representatives. All right, thank you 